بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ياسين والقرآن الحكيم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أولم يرى الإنسان أنا خلقناه أنا خلقناه من نطفة فإذا هو خصيم وضرب لنا مثلا ونسي خلقه قال من يحيي العظام وهي رميم قل يحييها الذي أنشأها أول مرة وهو بكل خلق عليم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين uh, we're in the last passage or the last portion here of Surah Yasin, and as I've been explaining, this is a conclusion, a kind of a wrap up of the entire surah. There was an introduction which laid out the basic premise of the surah and uh, spoke about the basic themes of the surah, addressed them, and then there were three passages that followed. The first one talked about prophethood and the issue of messengers, representatives from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala carrying the message. The second, or the rather now the third passage after that was about Tawheed, oneness of God, uh, the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and how to come to that conclusion very naturally, very organically, simply by making an observation of that which is around the human being. And then the fourth passage was about the life of the hereafter. That based on the first, what the, uh, the second and third passage were presenting, prophethood and Tawheed, Tawheed and Prophethood. How a person would react to these things, how he would interact with them, whether he would accept them or reject them, would determine his fate in the life of the hereafter. And that's what this fourth passage talked about, which was the hereafter, and what will exactly transpire on the Day of Judgment, and in the life of the hereafter, and the fact that there will be two groups, Ashab al-Jannah and then Ashab al-Nab. And we, we, there were two passages, one that talked about Ashab al-Jannah, one that talked about Ashab al-Nab, within that fourth passage itself. Now this is the final portion of the surah, and this final portion is the conclusion. It's basically wrapping up all of these issues that have been spoken about, and it's very synchronized. Uh, yesterday I was able to point out how we studied three ayat that were very, very close, and resembled three ayat that we had studied in the beginning of the surah. So this is the conclusion of the surah, and part of the beauty of surah Yasin is how it's been packaged. It's very, very tightly and very properly packaged together. And that's part of the power and the beauty of the surah that it contains the entire message very precisely packaged in a very small, uh, in a very small and manageable portion. The entire message, all of da'wah, the entire summary of the Qur'an has been put together and can be presented to someone. And that's why we discussed even in the fada'il of the surah, the Prophet ﷺ even recommends for Surah Yasin to be read by, to be recited to people who are experiencing difficulty in going through the pangs of death. It's simply because when they have understood what this surah means and they reflect on the meaning of it, it'll naturally bring, it'll raise their iman, literally. It'll raise their iman, it'll allow them to connect very properly with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be able to smoothly transition into the next life. Now, the, yesterday the portion that we studied, the ayat we studied, it ended with, with uh, ayah number 77, or rather, ayah number 76. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses the Prophet and says, فَلَا يَحْزُنْكَ قَوْلُهُ You should not be grieved. You shouldn't be troubled by what these people have said. That what they say, their words, their words should not trouble you. They shouldn't cause you any grief. Why? Because we most definitely know everything that they do privately and everything they do publicly. And, the, and I explained how this statement of their words should not trouble you. This is both a consolation to the Prophet and it's a very high honor for the Prophet It's great distinction for the Prophet that Allah Himself is taking responsibility and saying, don't worry about what they say, I'll take care of them. That's, that's a great honor for the Prophet ﷺ. That's Allah being very defensive. You know when you love somebody and you care about someone, and somebody says something, you get automatically get very defensive? You jump in to try to prevent, hey, don't talk to him like that. Who, who do you think you are? You don't talk to him that way. You get very defensive. 
Because you care so much about this person that just naturally causes that reaction with you. This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defending the Prophet And this shows the status of the Prophet Now, there's one question that can pop into a person's mind. I explained in the beginning of the surah, because this is a conclusion. In the beginning of the surah, Allah was also consoling the Prophet in the beginning of the surah. Salaamuna alayhim an dhartahum an nam tudhirhum la yukminu. Allah was consoling the Prophet in the beginning of the surah. And throughout the Quran, this is a very common occurrence that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala consoles the Prophet and comes to the aid and comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and through the Quran, He emotionally comforts the Prophet. Somebody could also ask the question that was Muhammad very, very sensitive? Why does he need so much consolation? Why is he constantly being consoled? Did he take everything personally? Was he offended by everything? Couldn't he take a little bit of criticism? Couldn't he deal with what comes with the territory? This is prophethood after all. This is da'wah. This isn't a walk in the park. Why couldn't he deal with what comes with the territory? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers that objection in these next ayat that we're going to read today. These ayat that we're going to study, especially the first two, 77 and 78, Allah answers this objection, this possible question, this possible criticism that could pop into somebody's mind. That's the first thing. And the second thing is that, like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has condemned these people. Yesterday in ayah number 75, 74 and 75, Allah very, very strongly condemned these people. And I explained how that was a very powerful and a very scary image. That while these people are being punished and tortured in the fire of hell, all those things that they preferred and gave priority to Allah above and beyond, uh, all those things they gave priority to above Allah, before and above and beyond Allah, all those things will be made to stand right by them and will be watching them. And these people will see their idols and their false gods and their false deities standing there watching them being punished and tortured. So Allah very, very strongly condemned them. That's such a strong condemning of someone is going to be justified here in the next, these next two ayahs. Similarly, the consolation of the Prophet Why is the Prophet being consoled by Allah? That will also be justified in these next two ayahs. So I just wanted to explain the connection and how this is proceeding forward. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ayah number 77, He says, أَوَلَمْ يَرَى insan." Has the human being not seen? Has the human being not seen? Now I explained many times before this word, this comes from the word ra'a, from ru'ya, which means to see, but also when you are having an intellectual, this type of a reflective discussion with someone, and use the word of ru'ya, it also is used in the meaning of to not to just see something on the surface, but to understand it, to process it, to comprehend it, to reflect on it, to deeply think about it. That haven't these people realized, haven't they thought about, haven't they reflected? Al-insan, the human being. Now, two lessons ago, in the beginning of the passage, <clears throat> two lessons ago, in the beginning of the passage, I explained how when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking to these people, He's talking to them directly. Allah is speaking Himself. That we have created for them. Allah is speaking. Because Allah is mentioning to them all the blessings of Allah that have been showered upon these people. That don't they realize? I gave them this and this and this. And I explained how psychologically that's a very powerful way to make somebody realize their mistake and their error and their, the, the mistake that they're making basically. The, yesterday's lesson, we saw that now as a result of them not accepting, not realizing, despite Allah speaking to them of all the blessings Allah showered upon them, and they are still not listening, still not understanding, that now Allah is so angry and so displeased with them, He's not speaking directly to them anymore. He speaks in the third person. And they have taken, other than Allah, other false gods and false deities of worship. They have, they have turned to other people and other things aside from Allah. Now he's speaking even about himself in the third person. Because he's completely turned away from them. And I explained how when you're displeased, disappointed, angry with someone, you turn away from them. But Allah is still talking about those people. 
He's still speaking about them in the pronoun that they have done this. In this passage here now, Allah completely just, it's as if Allah doesn't even acknowledge them. Awalam yaral insan has the human being not thought. He's not saying, haven't they thought about this? Haven't you thought about this? Haven't they? Not even they. Hasn't the human being considered? You know, just if, if you just don't want to acknowledge somebody's existence at all, the teacher doesn't even want to say he's not even taking this into consideration. He just doesn't want to acknowledge that he realizes that this particular student is even a part of his class. He says, the student. He just starts speaking, the student doesn't do his homework. Just completely as if that guy doesn't even exist. He doesn't have an identity. He's not even affording him the third person pronoun anymore. That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does here. He says, Awalam yaral insan. Hasn't the human being, hasn't the insan, the human being, considered this, thought about this? Now, who is re being referred to here by when Allah says, Al insan? So there are many, many different narrations. All of them are mentioned in the books of Tafasir in, in detail. Ubay bin Khalaf, there's a narration talking about Ubay bin Khalaf. There's a narration talking about Al As ibn Wa'il. There's a narration talking about Abu Jahal. There are narrations mentioning all of these different leaders of the mushrikeen of the Quraysh who were at the head of the opposition to the da'wah, the message of the Prophet ﷺ. They were very abusive, very arrogant and very abusive towards the Prophet ﷺ and the believers. And they were very confrontational and very disrespectful. It wasn't just sort of thing like let's agree to disagree. No, no, no. You are wrong and you're crazy and you're a liar and you're a magician and you're a poet. Very aggressive, very confrontational. So different narrations mention that this al-insan, this human being, is one of these specific men. But at the same time, the Mufassirin also point out that it could be relating to it could be related to these individuals, it could be pertaining to these, these individuals, but at the same time it has a general broad meaning as well. The human being in general. Because like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, Surah Al-Tagabun, وَالَّذِي خَلَقَكُمْ فَمِنْكُمْ كَافِرْ وَمِنْكُمْ مُؤْمِنْ He has created all of you, so from amongst you is the disbeliever, the kafir, the ungrateful, the ingrate, and from amongst you is the believer, the mu'min. Why does Allah mention kafir first? وَلَا تَجِدُوا أَكْثَرَهُمْ شَاكِرِينَ قَلِيلًا مَا تَشْكُرُونَ So because Allah has told us in the Qur'an that despite the truth, and the reality, and this truth and reality being obvious and being self-evident all around this human being, majority of people will not understand. They won't realize, they won't understand, they won't be grateful, they won't believe. Majority of people will not believe. So this reality is present here when Allah says, Awalam ya al insan. Hasn't the human being thought about this? And even if we look around today, there might be as many Muslims at one point, whatever, billion Muslims all over the world. But at the end of the day, that is still a minority. That's still a, a smaller number compared to all the people in the entire world. So this pattern Allah is kind of let, Allah is telling us within the Qur'an itself, the majority of people don't realize these things. They don't think about these things. And so the majority of the people will not ever come to this realization of Iman. And that's a that's very sad reality. But at the same time, why is that important for us to know? Why is it being mentioned to us in the Qur'an? Why is that important for us to realize that should, this fact that majority of people will not believe should make us even that much more grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if we have the realization of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. If Allah has given us some level of, the, uh, of Iman in Tawheed, Risala, Akhira, Qur'an, Islam, that should make us that much more grateful. That we are small, we are a part of a small minority. We are a part of a small group of people that Allah bestows Iman upon. It's a huge blessing of Allah that we should never, ever, ever take for granted. Because majority of the people do not have this blessing. So, awalam yarat insan. Hasn't the human being taken this into consideration? Hasn't he realized? Allah says that we created him min nutufa. Nutfa, of course, refers to a drop of sperm. That we created him, this human being, from a drop of sperm. فَإِذَا هُوَ خَصِيمُ مُبِينَ إِذَا إِذَا in the Arabic language, لِلْمُفَاجَعَةِ uh, it, it basically, it, expre uh, it expresses surprise, shock, amazement at something. Like all of a sudden, something happened. Either it, it, has, it can have one of two implications. Either something happened all of a sudden, without any explanation, faster and quicker than people thought, so it was shocking in that way. Or it can also express 
shock. Like, really? That's what it ended up in? That's, that's the outcome of this? Like, just total shock, amazement at how something that started there could end up here. Just, just like somebody's baffled at the, at the result of something. So Allah says, فَإِذَا Then all of a sudden, huwa, the same human being that Allah granted existence to from a, from, from a drop, from a drop of fluid, Allah granted him existence. Allah created him from a drop of fluid. So he's basically nothing. He was what we consider filth, najasa. I mean, it's something to think about. We all know, I mean, it's, it's a technicality, it's an issue of filth. But we all know, we all understand that you require ghusl afterwards, you have to wash it or scrape it out of your clothes, you have to clean your clothes from it, we consider it najasa, it's filth, najis. So the Allah is saying this human being, we created him from najasa, not just filth, that's what we created him from, that's his reality, those are his beginnings. Because the human being is uh, made up of two things, there's the body, the physical element, and then there's the spiritual element, the ruh. Now the ruh has a very noble beginning, it was up in Alam al Allah, stood witness before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Qalu Bala. They all stood before Allah and said, when he asked Allah to be not become, am I not your Lord and Master? Bala, most definitely you are. So the ruh has a very noble beginning. But the human being, the average typical human being, what does he pride himself on? Uh, on? The, the physical part of him or the ruh? It's the physical. The body, the physical element. That's what he prides himself on, that's what he likes to feed, that's what he likes to nourish, that's the type of enjoyment and pleasure that he craves, is the physical, the animal. And that's what, that's what deludes him. It's either his intelligence, or it's his strength, or it's his beauty, his ability. These are the things that delude him, these are the things that uh, make him arrogant, and these are the things that he indulges in, and that make him proud, that he's proud of, that he boasts about. So Allah is embedded here, implicitly there's a very powerful message. That everything that this human being prides himself on, and everything that deludes him, what is, what is the beginning of it? It's filth. It's najasa. It's something you can't even pray if you have on your clothes. There's a very harsh reality here. A very bitter pill to swallow here. So Allah says, أَوَلَمْ يَرَى الْإِنسَانِ أَنَّا خَلَقْنَاهُ مِنْ That's the first lesson. That we, that's what we created him from. Why is he so proud? Why is he so arrogant, so boastful? So that's the first lesson here. That's the first thing he needs to realize and he needs to think about. Okay, what's the next thing? فَإِذَا هُوَ خَصِيمُ مُبِينَ On top of that, you know, crime on top of crime. Sin on top of sin. What is the most, the most baffling thing about this human condition? The, the situation of this human being? Not only did he come from such you know, pathetic beginnings. But where does he end up? إِذَا هُوَ خَصِيمُ مُبِينَ All of a sudden, هُوَ He is خَصِيم. خَصِيم in the Arabic language, خَصَم means to argue with someone. It means to confront someone and to argue with someone. But it means not just a normal confrontation or argument. Not like a very <coughs> respectful, knowledgeable debate. No, no, no. It means like a loud, shouting argument. And it means somebody who like, he's pointing his finger and he's stomping and he's yelling at the top of his lungs when he's arguing against you. He's adamant, arrogant, insistent. That type of an, uh, uh, that type of uh, a person who's confronting you and who's arguing with you. Khasim. Khasim means somebody who's just really, really stuck on his point. He doesn't want to listen. He's the one who every time you try to talk to him, he says, listen brother, let me explain to you. And he just talks over you. And he yells at you. And he's pointing his finger in your face and he keeps yelling. And every time you try to talk to him, calm him down a little, oh, he goes at it again. That is Khasim. There's, there's hyperbole in the form of this word. Mubin. Mubin means self-evident. Like he's just yelling. Like you know when somebody gets in an argument very, very loudly, right there in the lobby of the masjid? Or right here in the multi-purpose uh, room of the masjid? Can anybody miss that? Everybody sees it. He's doing it for everybody. He didn't take somebody in a room and then kind of, you know, get into it with somebody. Then when it comes out, then the gossip, the rumor mill starts. Hey, did you hear what he said to him? No, no, it doesn't take that. This guy's standing right there deriding, some, deriding somebody. He's degrading him right there in public, humiliating him in public, there for everybody to see. He's making it a public affair, a public situation. He's causing a scene. 
So Allah says, فَإِذَا هُوَ خَصِمُ مُبِينَ This human being, he all of a sudden becomes very argumentative, very confrontational, and very arrogant, and he's doing it publicly and openly against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, against the Messenger of Allah, against the Qur'an, against the truths, the realities of life. So when you put the whole ayah together, what it means is, hasn't this human being realized where he came from? Where we created him from? And then the most shocking thing, فَإِذَا the most shocking thing is, even though he came from there, where did, what does he end up doing? Does he humble himself? Does he listen? Does he realize? No. He starts engaging in argument. And he's publicly arguing, and publicly just being disrespectful. Not only that, it doesn't stop there. But then this human being, he thinks he's smarter. He thinks it, the arrogance, it doesn't stop there. Arrogance clouds a person's judgment. It doesn't allow a person to think sensibly, realize what he's doing. So the next ayah, ayah number 78 says, وَضَرَبَ لَنَا مَثَلًا Allah says, He gives us an example. Let me explain something to you, brother. You know that guy? Let me explain something. You know that guy? Who you know obviously better than he goes in to see the doctor. The doctor says, you know, you need to watch out for this. You know, let me explain something. Okay, I looked it on Wikipedia. All right, this is what they said. So that guy, this is that type of a guy, but even worse. This is the worst type of guy. He is saying to Allah. He's saying this to the Messenger of Allah. He's saying this to the Quran. Listen, let me explain to you how things work. Let me explain something to you, all right? So Allah says He gives us an example. You know why that's so... That's just... It, it's, still, it's ridiculous. It's just so preposterous. Aside from how obvious it is that, you know, He's giving Allah an example. He's giving an example to the Messenger of Allah. He's sitting there trying to explain to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Let me explain something to you. That in and of itself is just beyond... Uh, it's, it's, it's just beyond stupid. But why it's even more preposterous, why it's even more just such, such a predicament is because throughout the Qur'an, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do? He gives us examples. He gives you an example from yourselves. Allah has struck an example. An, extra, an example has been struck. Throughout the Qur'an, throughout the, throughout the discourse of the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is constantly giving us examples to teach us, to explain things to us. And for this guy, for Mr. Genius here to come, around, come along and flip the script and say, wait a second, let me explain something to you. That makes it even that much more just ridiculous and stupid. So he says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ضَرَبَ لَنَا مَثَلًا He gives us an example. وَنَسِيَ خَلْقًا Very, very powerful. Allah says, He must have forgotten His own creation. Meaning he must have forgotten the fact that he was created and how he was created. What that exactly means is now Allah is explaining to us. Because the reader, the listener, the believer when he reads this, darabana mathalan, he 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 the natural reaction is he scratches his head. Who would be so arrogant to think that he can sit down and explain something to Allah or the Messenger of Allah? So Allah explains to us, you know how a person could be that arrogant? Or what kind of a person could do that? That person must have forgotten the fact that Allah created him. There's no other explanation for this. Nobody else would be this arrogant. Nobody else, nobody else would be so foolish enough to think that he could explain something to Allah or his messenger or the Quran. He must have forgotten where he came from. The fact that he was created by Allah. That's the only possible explanation that somebody could be this foolish or this arrogant. He's completely forgotten his own creation, his own beginnings, where he came from, the fact that he was created by Allah. Okay, so what's all the fuss about? What is this example that he's giving? He said, Man who yuhil idam, and this who is it's it's kind of like uh, in Kari. It's basically him just uh, showing shock, showing just complete dismay at this idea. So he's saying that who could ever? Like, do you really think it's possible? Do you really think somebody could do this? Who could ever do this? Yuhil idam. Who could ever bring bones back to life? Who could ever put life back into bones? Yuhil idam. Wahi ramim. 
when these bones have become dust. Ramim refers to when bone, even the bones of the body are just completely falling apart. Even when the skeleton is just completely uh, decomposing and it's just completely falling apart into different pieces, that refers to it. Ramim. It's literally falling apart in your hands. When you touch it, it just falls apart. That's called the Ramim. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, who could ever put life back into these bones when they've completely fallen apart to the point where when you touch them, it just becomes dust? Who could ever put life back into them? So this person, and there are actually narrations in the books of Tafsir and Sirah and the books of Hadith that mention that these same type of individuals, Abu Jahal, Asu ibn Wail, Ubay bin Khalaf, these type of people, they came to the Prophet ﷺ holding old decomposed bones that they dug out of the ground, they would dig them out of the ground, they would hold them, come to the Prophet ﷺ, show them to the Prophet ﷺ and say, so you're trying to tell me somebody's going to bring this back to life? They would come, they would shove it in the face of the Prophet ﷺ and say, you're trying to tell me somebody's going to bring this back to life? I'd like to see that happen. I'd really like to see that happen. That level of area. So this, so that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying. Dharaba lana mathalan. He gives us an example. Wana siya khalqa. And this foolish person has forgotten where he came from. Qala ma yuhita ilama. And Allah has already mentioned the previous ayah where he came from. And what is, what is this person saying? Ma yuhita ilama. Who could ever bring these bones back to life? Wa hiya rameen. When it's fallen apart, it's just decomposing. It's practically become dust. Are you kidding me? Do you really think I'm that stupid? Come on. Come on, stop messing around with us. Stop playing around. So that's that's the tone of these people. And then finally, in ayah number 79 here, and we'll go ahead and we'll stop here for today, inshallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answers this objection, this question, this, this stupidity of theirs. Allah responds to it. And He teaches the Prophet ﷺ how to respond to it. And by extension, He's teaching us how to respond to this as well. Allah says, Qul, Say, tell them. Yuhyiha. You want to know who's going to bring it back to life? Alladhi, the one who ansha'aha awwala marwa. The one who not only created it in the first place, but then raised it. There's a very, very profound point here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not only answers their question, their objection, but goes beyond it. Just completely, like we say, just completely makes them quiet. Just completely shuts them up. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ansha'aha. He didn't say, Alladhi khalaqaha awla marra. He didn't say the one who created this bone in the first place. No, no, no. Ansha'aha. The word nasha'a, ansha'a. Ansha'a means not only to create something, but then to raise it. To care for it, to watch after it, to feed it, and to raise it. Kind of like, just imagine a plant. You plant the seed, you water, you, you f make sure the s soil is fertile, you plant the seed, you water it, and then you put it in sunlight, then you water it, make sure it's in sunlight, you water it, make sure there's no bugs getting into it, and you continue to raise it. That's called ansha, insha. That's the meaning of this word. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling them, you know this bone that you're holding in your hand? By the way, this is a grown, this is the bone after it had grown. This is the bone after it had reached its old age, its adult form. But this human being, if it's a human bone that you're talking about, or any animal, any creature, by the way, it wasn't that size when we first created it. It was small. It was tiny. Like a baby, like a child. And then it continues to grow. And who raised it? Allah. Who allowed it to grow? Allah. Not only that, but look how miraculously the human body grows. Not only are, is, are the bones within the body growing and increasing, but the body around it is growing and increasing as well. And it's, everything is proportional. Everything is perfect. Taqdeer. Ala qadr. Khalaqna kulla shayin bi qadr. Allah created everything in proportion. He created it perfectly. So the whole body grows with it. And Allah provides that to the body so that not only the bone can grow, but the body that's encasing, that this bone is encased in can also grow. And it can flourish. And it can be healthy. 
So this bone that you're holding in your hand, not only did Allah create it, so the one who created it in the first place will bring it back to life, but foolish man, what you didn't realize is that this bone that you're holding in your hand is the end product. This is not how it came. When, when it first arrived in this world, it was small, it was tiny. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave it growth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed it to grow. And you're forgetting about that whole process. So this creator that I'm telling you about is so much more amazing than you'll ever realize. He will bring this bone back to life because he's the one who created it in the first place. Not only did he create it, but this bone, this hard thing that you, you just can't imagine, you can't fathom how this would have grown, how it was small and it became big. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who gave it its existence. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that allowed it to flourish and to grow. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who gave it death. And Allah is the one who's going to put life back into it again. You just don't realize this. He most definitely Allah. He most definitely bikulli khalqin alim. He is completely informed. Informed all the time of each and every single thing that He has ever created. Anything, everything that He has created, He is completely informed of it at all times, at all places, in all situations. The same meaning is found in Surah Al-Mulk, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ala ya'alamu man khalaq. That doesn't He know the one who created? I mean, the one who created it, doesn't He know? And that same ayah has another meaning, Ala ya'alamu man khalaq. al yani al-makhluq. That wouldn't Allah know that which He has created Himself? Who knows it better than Allah? Nobody does. So Allah says, وَهُوَ بِكُلِّ خَلْقٍ عَلِيمٍ You came to talk to Allah, you came to argue with Allah, and you not only wanted to argue, you wanted to give examples, and you had theories, and you had discussions, and proofs, and evidences, you had all these, you wrote a big old thick old book, to tell Allah about that which He created? Are you really that foolish? Allah knows it a lot better than you ever will. Allah knows everything about it, He's the one who created it. And so in this answer that's being given in ayah number 79, two questions. They just ask one question. Can anybody really put life back into this? They, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught the Prophet sallallahu and is teaching us to not only answer that question, by saying yes, somebody can put life back into it, but to, to specify who is that someone who will put life back into it, that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. Not only that, but then to provide proof and evidence to them. Where do you think it came from in the first place? And this growing process, the, the, the life cycle that this bone has already gone through, is proof and evidence, is secondary proof. And secondary evidence of the fact that yes, Allah is fully capable of putting life back into this thing. This is inshallah where we'll go ahead and stop today and we'll uh, pick up from here inshallah tomorrow. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the ability to practice everything that's been said and heard. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanahu wa bihamdik, nashhadu wa la ilaha illa wa ta'ala s-sakhfir.